morning's lesson is living with offenses. Nobody's ever had to live with offenses, have they? Surely not. Not in this day and age, not in this time, not, not in the world that we're living in. But whether you're the, the offender or the offended, living under the shadow of offenses can be a painful experience. The account we're about to cover focuses on the offender's perspective. Some may never know that they've even caused an offense. And others may be undeniably aware of their actions while being tormented by their guilt daily, yet unable to admit their wrongdoing. Such was the case with Joseph's brothers. The satisfaction they felt while walking away with their money in hand after their brother was taken into captivity by their actions quickly disappeared when they saw the devastation, this loss inflicted on their father. You can be certain that they were wishing they could simply experience the jealousy of Joseph's presence instead of the pain of seeing their father grieve continuously for years. They must have imagined that Jacob would quickly recover from the grief and move on. This clearly did not happen. Their actions, which they thought would bring peace and relief to their lives, actually increased their suffering. What was worse, they felt incapable of admitting, of admitting their wrongdoing for fear that it would damage their relationship with their father and heap even more suffering on themselves. This is the power of the enemy over humanity. He will do his best to convince us that a particular action is not only justified, but will be a benefit to us. Only then to laugh at our suffering when we give in to his advice. Jesus reminded his disciples in John 10.10. I think we just talked about this recently. The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. This has been his behavior from the beginning. He looks for opportunities to work his destruction. As a roaring lion, he seeks out the spiritually weak among the flock and whispers in their ears just the right words to evoke a divisive response. He's most satisfied when we're most miserable. But Jesus went on to say in John 10, 10, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Jesus came to defeat the enemy of our souls once and for all. But Satan remains active for now, seeking every opportunity to, to divide souls through any offense he can any offense, in, any, in, in, any offense he can inspire humanity to inflict on one another. This provides us with an option. We can either choose God and His will and be blessings one to another, or we can listen to the enemy, suffer ourselves, and cause those whom we love to suffer as well. Isn't that what happened in the account of Joseph and his brothers? The ten truly loved their father, but by their actions, they wounded him deeply. This, this is a sad situation, and it would be years before anything good could come from it. But God would use their failure to benefit many. Romans 8.28 applies as much to the past as it does to the present and the future. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called, according to His purpose. In the commentary this morning, with this lesson we consider the account of an offense that spanned a period of over 20 years. So many times people involved in the perpetration of an offense will try to convince themselves that a, potent, that a partial fix to soothe their conscience is enough, so long as the result of the matter is not as bad as it might have been otherwise. Isn't that better than nothing done at all? At least for a brief moment, perhaps, they may feel as if their actions were adequate and so should be accepted as the final action regarding the matter. 
they continually reassure themselves that they really and truly had performed all that reasonably could have been expected of them. After all, a person can only do so much, can go only so far, right? Those whom they have injured may never question, may never have an embarrassing comment or question regarding what had happened. Their silence is their affirmation that all is well, or at least satisfactory, isn't it? The injured parties may even offer their own reassurance that all is well. But deep down inside, the offenders know better. It certainly is sad when someone has succumbed to an offense. It's sadder still that the person would try to live with the guilt of that offense. Such is the circumstance surrounding the offense considered in this lesson. Golden truth. And they said one to another, We are very guilty concerning our brother, and that we saw the anguish of his soul when he besought us, and we would not hear. Therefore is this distress come upon us. Genesis 42 and 21. At this point in the account, uh, of Joseph and his brothers, resolution was just around the corner. They and their father had suffered many years as a direct result of their actions. They had never admitted to their father what they had done. They had simply lived with the guilt of knowing their father was suffering because of what they had done. They couldn't imagine how much more intense his suffering would have been if he had known the truth. They knew that their current predicament was a direct result of their guilt. At least that's what their conscience was telling them. So they simply carried the unbearable weight of their guilt without feeling the liberty to experience true freedom forgiveness could bring. But that truth would soon come to light. Their father would come to know what they had done. Numbers 32 and 23, second part there, be sure your sin will find you out. Any comments, thoughts, questions on this introduction before we move into the individual sections of this lesson? I'm sure there were things there in uh, that family's life that Jacob had good days to. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> and we go through life and things happen to us. Uh, we all have good days and bad days. Uh, we don't want to talk about the loss of a loved one or whatever the case may be, there's always scenarios where there's good and there's bad. Um, and I'm sure Jacob also had good days uh, that he was able to continue on in his life. Uh, but these brothers, they couldn't get away from their guilty conscience. Right. Uh, you, can, you can do a lot of things when you, when you simply are suffering a loss, when you uh, don't have that peace of knowing uh, what happened or anything else but when you know you have done something wrong there's no peace that can be found right. when you get it right. right anything else part one the way of the offender our golden truth captures the sad condition of the person described previously he bears the reproach of knowing that he has offended or otherwise wronged others and that burden weighs heavily upon him he would turn to someone who might show him pity and reassure him that matters really aren't so bad, that they will get better. But in order to gain their pity and comfort, he first would have to share with them the shameful, shameful nature of the burden which he now bears. How could then they then have pity on the one who thus had brought this burden upon himself through his own folly? This man's problem and the condition of guilt that he now lives under is succinctly described in two verses of Scripture. First, one cannot hide from his past action. I just read it. Be sure your sin will find you out. Numbers 32 and 23. Secondly, one cannot escape the consequences. The way of the transgressors is hard. Proverbs 13, 15. The event that we are speaking of involves the treatment Joseph received at the hands of his own brothers when they took him and sold him into slavery. The full account of Joseph and his brothers spans from Genesis chapter 37 through Genesis chapter 45. More scripture is devoted to this event than to any other single event recorded in Genesis. The account of this offense spanned over 20 years from the circumstances leading up to it until its final resolution. It affected the lives of all involved, offender, 
offended, and innocent bystanders. Standers. Only by God's divine intervention was the offense ever resolved. God has no desire for anyone to suffer needlessly. But if we'll trust Him, He can make an amazing, even an unbelievable difference, just as He did in the situation with Joseph and his brothers. What the enemy means for destruction, God can turn to good. But we have to be willing to acknowledge the potential future good in even the worst of circumstances. We may not see it now, but hope remains. We might not understand the why, but God knows exactly how He's going to work all things for our good if we simply trust Him in the meantime. Any comments here? Part 2, Offense Festers. Genesis 37, 3 through 5. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. We find in this passage the ingredients that contributed to the conditions that enabled the offense to occur. Jacob loved one son, Joseph, more than his others. This was apparent to the other sons of Jacob. That Jacob gave excuse me, a coat of many colors to Joseph further contributed to that perception. The term perception describes how we see, how we view what's before us. How true that perception is to reality is another matter. Was it true that Jacob loved Joseph more? As a father, he would have surely loved them all. Was it that he favored Joseph's company because he was the elder son of his dear deceased Rachel, whom he so loved? To be with Joseph was the nearest Jacob could come to being with Rachel, at least to his memories of her. Now in this instance, Scripture makes it clear that Jacob did love Joseph more than his other sons. This is another aspect of this account that should cause us to pause and consider the fact, this fact more deeply. Now sometimes our behavior has the power to cause damage that we could never imagine. Jacob's preference actually shows us a reason behind a portion of the law that would come later. I'm going to pause right there. I'm going to back up just for a moment. In this instance, the, the offense to the brothers and that they saw that their father loved Joseph more was, was, was a fact. The Bible makes it clear that, Joseph, that Jacob did love Joseph more than his brothers. This wasn't simply a perception problem. But often the trials that we face, the difficulties that we experience, they are simply perception problems, the way we see things. And, and as we move forward, we, if we'll allow things to progress as they should, we may find out that it was simply a perception problem. And, and the enemy was trying to move us to cause a problem where none existed. In this instance, once again, as, as the Bible makes clear, there was a problem, and the problem was visible. Back up for just a second there. Jacob's preference actually shows us the reason behind a portion of the law that would come later. In Leviticus 18:18, 18, 18, we read, Neither shalt thou take a wife to her sister to vex her, to uncover her nakedness beside the other in her lifetime. This is part of the law. You can't marry sisters. You can't marry two sisters according to the law. Jewish law here. Now this came long after Jacob and his sons. But it seems clear from a broad view that we have the account of Jacob and his sons to prove the reason why this law was necessary in the first place. We also read in Deuteronomy 21, 15 through 17. If a man have two wives, one beloved and the other hated, and they have borne him children, both the beloved and the hated, and if the firstborn son be hers that was hated, 
Then it shall be when he maketh his sons to inherit that which he hath, that he may not make the son of the beloved firstborn before the son of the hated, which is indeed the firstborn. But he shall acknowledge the son of the hated for the firstborn, by giving him a double portion of all that he hath, for he is the beginning of his strength, the right of the firstborn is his. I'm sorry, could you repeat that scripture reference, please? Yeah, that's uh, Deuteronomy 21, 15 through 17. Thank you. In this portion of the law, we see a direct connection to the situation with Jacob and his sons. Anybody else catch that? Anybody see what's going on here? Although Joseph was the eleventh son, according to the birth order, Jacob was treating him as if he were the firstborn. This is where the jealousy began. It seems clear that these two laws were custom made to help the Jews avoid similar situations in the future. This is why. Why? Why do we have a law? I, I can imagine the Jews saying, well, why on earth do we have a law that says, says you can't have uh, two sisters as wives? Why on earth do we have a law that says uh, that, that you can't make the firstborn whoever you want? Look at Jacob and the kids. Look at it, Jacob and his children. This is why. We have an example. This is what's likely to happen it, it, that's the, the whole point of everything that God says is for our own good. God isn't uh, a cruel taskmaster, taskmaster trying to suck all the good out of life, suck all the fun out of life. But He knows the troubles that lie ahead and He would have us to avoid those troubles. Right. He wants us to understand the dangers in the choices that we make apart from Him. And this is only a single situation. This is only one instance in Scripture. But the Bible's full of similar situations. It's full of times that we see, well, why would God say this? Here you go. This is why. We, we need to understand that this is, once again, this is an isolated incident. But it, it should bring us understanding to the fullness of the instruction that God gives to us. Why does God tell us to do what He tells us to do? And why does God tell us to avoid the things that He would have us to avoid? Because He knows the results. It, as a good parent, any good parent's going to tell their children not to run with scissors. Well, I'm just trying to get to my work quicker. No, you don't run with scissors. The, ch the child has no idea that he could trip, stab himself with the scissors. The child's not even considered that possibility. The parent knows. The parent understands the danger. In the child's mind, <laughs> you're just being hard. You're just making things difficult for me. Why can't I run? I just, I just need to get there faster. Time is of the essence. <laughs> you know how children think. Time is of the essence. <laughs> it's not the words that they think, but it's the attitude that they have. So we, we need to understand that in the same way, God gives us instruction because He loves us and He's concerned for our well-being and He wants the best for us. It seems clear that these two laws were custom made to help the Jews avoid similar situations in the future. When we play favorites, we open the door for similar situations today. Yes, the brothers were wrong in their treatment of Joseph, but their father's favoritism is what the enemy used to try to destroy this family and thereby break the bloodline to the coming Messiah before he could be born. Jesus had, has already come. He already died for our sins and was raised again for our eternal life. But Satan has not ceased to do his best to divide humanity in any way he can. 
We must be aware of His devices, both in our treatment of others and how we perceive the way that we're treated ourselves. We need to be able to recognize the influence of the enemy and rebuke him. Only then will we be able to avoid similar difficulties in our own lives. Family relationships can be the most complicated of relationships. Their lives are so intertwined. Every event, every situation affects every other. Family members are affected by how their families are affected. Feelings and emotions become so blurred and blended together. This is true of our, both our spiritual and our natural families. This is true when we share the same parents and when we attend the same church. Any comments, thoughts on this particular section? Yes. Right. The real mom, the real dad, the real kids. Mm-hmm. The real dog, the real cat. <laughs> but when you talk about divorce and remarriage, mm-hmm. and the church is against that because it doesn't fit that situation in the Bible, but there again, it's for our own good. Mm-hmm. We know how complicated it is just in our daily lives and our family situation, but when you add I mean, seriously, mm-hmm. I know people that say, well, um, when we got married, we had to bring his dog and my three cats in there and his four kids and my two kids. And, and then you got a huge hodgepodge of a mess. Mm-hmm. And all that stems down to, you know, if we pray and seek the Lord and marry the right person and then try to keep the family together, you know, not go out and marry somebody else and be in a problem. That's just going to cause more problems. You got this family, this family blended back there getting together, and you got their problems that they've had, and mm-hmm. your problems, and it's just a constant. Well, that's, that's why second, third divorces, uh, first, first marriage is 50% mm-hmm. in, in divorce, and second marriage is it's like 60 something percent, and third marriage is it's 70 something percent, and it just goes up. And it's because all of those problems just compound. and without dealing with the issues initially, the problem never gets resolved and the troubles just get more convoluted and complicated the more that's added to it. The problem you got was that you're half the problem anyway. Right. So you're taking your half of the problem plus the emotions that you had in that relationship and get into another relationship and that person is dealing with the same stuff. Right. And then you got... More problems. Just different. Just different. I think what you just said there is it's a very important uh, part of this for us to realize. Uh, as the title of the section is Offense Festers, mm-hmm. uh, of course I had to think about it from a medical point of view. <laughs> um, but the word fester itself, I just looked it up, is defined as become it, it becomes worse or more intense, especially through long-term neglect mm-hmm. or indifference. Right. You're talking about that relationship between a husband and wife. Uh, if you just walk away from it and don't fix it, it's never going to get better. Right. But it's not just between a husband and wife. If you and I have a problem with each right. other and we just walk away from each other, it's never going to fix itself. Right. Uh, it will fester and make itself worse. Right. Uh, I'm sure we're all aware of the old, you know, scare tactic that doctors use everywhere uh, to say. You know, if you get a splinter, a splinter can kill you. Absolutely. Uh, and you don't think about that uh, because we take care of the problem. We get the splinter out of our hand and our immune system fights that and heals and comes back. But if we continue to leave it, mm-hmm. uh, whether it be a splinter, whether it be a cat scratch, whether it be right. anything, if we don't address the problem, it will bring about the on a medical standpoint, fester means to become septic. Mm. Uh, to have that infection enter the bloodstream so prominently that it spreads throughout the entire body. Right. Uh, we need to understand that offenses, <laughs> if they're not taken care of, will spread throughout the entire body and begin to cause death. Uh, infection 
causes death. It causes that gangrenous lack of blood flow right. that makes the tissue, the term is necrotic, but mm -hmm. it makes the tissue begin to die. Exactly. Uh, that's what these things will do, whether, as you brought out wonderfully here today, uh, whether in the case of Joseph's brother, where there was an actual offense there, right, or whether it's just, Brother Nick didn't shake my hand this morning. Mm -hmm. and, and that, I, he's got something against me. I know mm -hmm. he's mad at me for something. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it's something that is substantiated or not, right. if there is an offense there and we do not address it, it will cause death throughout the body. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's important for us to recognize that analogy between the body <clears throat> as a human individual and the body as a congregation, as the, bo the body as an organization. It's, it's identical, and that's why that analogy is made between the body and the church. You have an injury, you can, you can pick at it, and it'll never heal. You can rub dirt in it, and you'll get all sorts of infection. And, and that, spiritually, is often what we as humans have a tendency to do. Rather than adding those things, those ointments that, that heal, those ben things that will benefit us, putting a, a Band-Aid over it so things don't get over it, get into it, getting stitches so it doesn't uh, remain open and, and allow that infection to get into it. There are so many things spiritually that we need to recognize are, are identical. We would never, none of us here, I don't think any one of us here, if we got cut, would spread that cut open and go to the cat box and just rub it in. I, I just feel confident that no one's going to do anything like that. I appreciate that, but <laughs> I just feel confident that nobody's going to do anything like that. But spiritually, that's exactly what we do right. when an offense comes and we listen to the voice of the enemy. We have a choice to make. Uh, Joseph's brothers had a choice to make. They could have tolerated this bratty kid, which is exactly what they were dealing with. They were just dealing with a bratty brother. Uh, they could have just dealt with it. <laughs> He's a kid. That's what kids do or they could be offended and sell them into slavery. And a hundred other things they could have done. They, they actually intended to kill him because he was a bratty kid. Now, I don't know that everybody's had, uh, Shanna doesn't have any siblings. Sam doesn't have any siblings. I know you have some. <laughs> now, I know I have some. Uh, as, as aggravating as our brothers and sisters might have been growing up, I never, I never thought about, never seriously thought about killing my brother. Never seriously. I might have scared him a few times. But the, the thought of actually doing any harm to him never, never crossed my mind. And on, on the rare occasions when I accidentally hurt him, I still, I still feel bad to this day. I know there's one time he was, he was playing and he was going back on a pillow and just hitting, hitting the pillow. The pillow was on a hardwood floor. I pulled the pillow out from under him. I, to this day, I, you don't, you know, I don't even, you know, if you remember it. Well, I guess not after hitting the hardwood floor. But I, I still feel bad about it. I was probably eight or nine, and you were probably four or five, three or four, I don't know. 
But I still, to this day, feel bad about that. Obviously, obviously no lasting damage, but it hurt. It hurt you. You, you cried. I, I, like I said, I still feel bad about that. None of us would intentionally hurt one another. I, I don't believe any of us in this local congregation would intentionally do something to hurt one another. But when we do, when we hurt one another, we as the offender need to recognize it and do our best to make it right. And if we, if we are the offended, whether it's a perceived or an actual situation, that's, that's why Jesus said, uh, if someone hurts you, don't, don't talk about them. Go to them. If, if someone, if we feel like we've been offended, it's our responsibility to go to the one who we feel has offended us. Right. And it's already been said many times, uh, not even in this series of lessons, but just generally, it's been said that most of the time, it was a misunderstanding. It was a misperception. It was something that the devil whispered in our ear that wasn't true because he was trying to bring division into the body. Part three. Anything else before we move on? Just making sure. Okay. Part three, closer examination. The actual statement of the matter is, and when his brothers, brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him. We know what the brothers saw, that is what they perceived to be their truth. The first matter affected was their communication. They could not speak peaceably to him. As we've addressed in previous lessons, the question is, what was the true underlying root of this matter? The outward manifestation was that the brothers hated Joseph. The inward true situation was that the brothers were deeply hurt by their father's favoring of Joseph, whatever the reason and however explainable it might have seemed to Jacob. There seemingly was nothing that they could do to attain like favor with their father. How could they approach their father, Jacob, to express their deep hurt? They would have done well to figure out some way. The brothers were unable and unwilling to address the true problem. So they chose to be angry with Joseph, who had done them no harm. And Joseph, once again, was just a bratty brother. That's all. But it was his father's treatment that caused this jealousy to fester. Finally, was with all offenses a tipping point was re reached. Joseph dreamed a dream and he told it his brethren. After Joseph's second dream, his father Jacob, sensing the harm being caused, even rebuked Joseph. But the damage had already been done. The murmuring among his brothers served only to reinforce their assurance that their feelings toward Joseph were justified. Any thoughts here? ¿Qué impacto este hizo en la vida de ellos el vestido? So it's part of the impact that the garment made um, in their lives. Son misterios que, que están dentro de todo eso. There's a lot of mystery that's in there. A veces no se puede explicar con palabras. Maybe it just can't be explained with words. Y bueno, lo podemos entender un poco. We can understand a little bit. Porque José era un tipo y sombra, tipo y sombra de nuestro Señor. Because we know that Joseph was a type and shadow of our Lord Jesus Christ. Pero viéndolo, viéndolo este, uh, eh, para con ellos, eh, el impacto que, y por qué, por qué solo, uh, solo a él se le fue hecha esa, esa vestidura. And why was it that the, go, or the, the, the garment was given just to him, to Joseph? Porque no habla para convencer. Why they didn't talk about Benjamin? No habla para otro. Or ni para primogénito. Not even for the firstborn. Que fue era Rubén. That was Reuben. Mm -hmm. Sino específicamente a José. But specifically Joseph. Ahora lo que podemos ver es uh, si vamos un poco más atrás. And if we go just a little bit further back. Con la naturaleza en cual este hemos venido nosotros hemos nacido en este mundo. With uh, looking at the nature that we came into this world with. Esa naturaleza 
estaba muy fuerte dentro de ellos. That, that uh, nature was at very, was working very strongly within them. El cual no, tal vez no and maybe they, of course, they didn't understand. Pero también este, me llama la atención siempre que leo estas escrituras. But every time I read these scriptures, I notice. Del amor que, que Jacob. The, the love that Jacob tenía had for Joseph. Notice bien lo que dice la escritura. And you notice what the scripture says. Mm -hmm. Jacob, él amó a su mamá. He loved his mother. Y pagó el precio. And he paid the price. 14, años 14 years. Trabajar por ella. To work for her. Mm -hmm. y José and Joseph. Era un fruto del amor. Right. Was the fruit of the love. Exactly. For his true wife. Y era obvio. And it was obvious. Que tenía que protegerlo. That he had to protect que tenía him. Que and to love him. Y sabe que bíblicamente vemos que el primogénito es Rubén. And we see that biblically the firstborn was Reuben. ¿Cuántos años tenía Rubén? No lo sé. We don't know how old Reuben might have been. Pero cuando José este, nace y crece. But when Joseph um, is born and is brought up. Él toma ese liderazgo. He takes that leadership. Porque no se ve a través bíblicamente que, que otro tu, tuviera ese liderazgo que, que su padre le dio a José. Because we don't see that anybody else in the family had that role as what Jacob gave to Joseph. Hay detalles que la Biblia no lo dice. And there's a lot of details the Bible doesn't give us. Pero uh, Jacob, uh, José ya había, ya había este, delegado. But to, uh, J Jacob had already delegated that authority to Un Joseph. Un trabajo muy importante. A very um, important job. Y era supervisar a los demás pastores. And it was to be able to oversee the other shepherds. <laughs> Esto sabe que cada vez que yo leo estas escrituras, este Dios abre mi entendimiento y me bendice de una manera muy especial. And every time I read these scriptures, the Lord opens up my understanding and um, I get blessed every time. Y hay mucho que se puede compartir de todo esto. And there's a lot that could be said about this. Pero necesitamos que Dios sea. But we need that God. Ayudándonos. God helps us understand. Porque a medida iba yo estudiando estas lecciones. While I was studying the lesson. Dios me, 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 me viene enseñando qué es lo que hay dentro de nuestro corazón. God was showing me what, what is it that is in our hearts. Y una de las cosas para terminar, este, yo siempre me he preguntado por qué mis tres hermanos. And I've always said, why is it that my three brothers? No, no nos podemos hablar. We can't talk to each other. No podemos tener una una confraternidad. We can't spend time como together. Como familia. As a family. Porque tengo tres hermanos solo por parte de mi mamá. Because I have three brothers um, from my mom. We all share the same mom. Y hay uno de ellos que no no ha tomado la decisión de no hablar conmigo. The, them, each one of them has taken, made the decision that they don't, wanna, they don't talk to me. Pero cuánto, cuánto tiene que ver esto? And how much does that have to do? Y solamente el que, el que lo ha experimentado lo entiende. Eh, solamente yo, eh, solamente yo soy, fui engendrado, por, so, fui el hermano de ellos. I was their brother. Por parte de mi papá. Just because of my dad. My dad. Uh -huh. Porque solamente mi papá me engendró y, y este, se separaron. It, just because I was born and then my mom and my dad separated. Y ya no más se volvieron a conocer. And then I, we never got to know each other again. Pero es algo que yo lo he experimentado. But it's something that I have experienced. Y uh, bueno, hay, han habido ocasiones que han hablado conmigo, pero han hablado para golpear. And they've talked to me on some occasions, but they've really talked to me very, very forcefully, mm. harshly, yo, cruelly. Yo experimenté eso. And I have experienced porque that. Porque en una ocasión los, los, los invité a, a mi casa. I remember on one occasion I invited them to my house. Para tener una, una, una bonita este, eh, uh, fiesta. To have a, a small uh, gathering. <laughs> Pero no se puede. Pero es interesante lo que, lo que vemos a través de la vida de Jacob y de, de, de sus hijos. Pero es aquí donde necesitamos nosotros permitirle a Dios que sane nuestro corazón. But we just, that's where we need God to heal our hearts. Ellos pensaban que estaba bien. They thought that they were, they were fine. Y cuando Jacob And when Jacob escuchó el sueño heard about the dream, lo he rebuked uh, Joseph, y eso alimentó más a los otros, and that basically fueled the fire for the others, para, 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 para que ellos se sintieran más este, confirmado de que, que lo que sentían en contra de su hermano, it just gave them more reason to feel like they had a reason to feel what they felt against their brother, era lo correcto, and that, that they were correct, pero en la otra lección vamos a ver algo muy importante, but we'll see something in the next lesson, <laughs> <laughs> bueno, <laughs> Chris, yes. Uh, Jacob paid a handsome price for Rachel, and so his love was really, really deep for her. 
Absolutely, absolutely. We don't know how much damage we can cause by the choices that we make, by the things that we say, the things that we do. Uh, we have to be very careful. We have to allow the Spirit to be in control. Part 4, the deed is done. Genesis 37, 18 through 20. And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Come now, therefore, and let us slay him and cast him into some pit. And we will say, Some evil beast hath devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. The brothers, murmuring among themselves, was now in full demonstration. Each assured the others that such extreme measures were justified, indeed, indeed required, they thought that they had found the perfect plan with a perfect cover-up, as though covering it up would make it go away. Genesis 37, 21 through 22, 26 and 27. And Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said unto them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness, and lay no hand upon him, that he might rid him out of their hands to deliver him to his father again. And Judah said unto his brethren, what profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him unto the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh, and his brethren were content. Does anybody see an analogy here? I'm not going to go into that. But Before the deed could be done, the older brothers already sensed the gravity, the irreversibility of what, would, what they now contemplated. Reuben and later Judah each sought for a way out of their headlong plunge into self-destruction and humiliation. In the end, at least the life of their brother Joseph had been spared. Surely, this was good enough, wasn't it? The brothers made their choice and the damage had been done. Their self-assurance would soon turn into despair and their contentment would soon become deep sorrow. Proverbs 20 and 17 tells us, the bread of deceit is sweet to a man, but afterwards his mouth shall be filled with gravel. The brothers would soon experience the truth of this proverb. Still, God is merciful beyond measure. In this and every other similar situation, God has a plan that has the potential to work for the good of many if even a single person will be faithful through the midst of the trial. Joseph would be that man. It could have been anyone involved. But Joseph rose up to fulfill this role. We can't imagine what could have happened if the brothers had resisted the temptation to hate their brother. But we can be sure that it would have been just as miraculous. God's will cannot be destroyed by the enemy. The circumstances may change, but the end result will bring glory to God. We only have to acknowledge the part God would have us to play and then be faithful to His will. It doesn't matter if the world is crumbling around us. If, we, if I as an individual will submit myself to God's will, He will be glorified and I will be benefited. And it's the same for each and every one of us. It doesn't matter who it is. It doesn't matter what the situation. It doesn't matter who's involved. It doesn't matter the, the perceived or the real damage that's been done. It, it doesn't matter. Nothing about the situation or the circumstances matter other than our willingness to be faithful to God. If we 
will simply trust God. Joseph, as, as the, this, uh, this lesson points out, suffered for give or take 20 years as a result. He had plenty of time to turn his back on God. He had plenty of opportunity to recognize the desperation of a situation and give up. But he never did. He never did. We need to understand that whatever it is that each of us is going through right now, because there's never a time when any of us are not going through something, not dealing with something. Whatever it is, we need to be willing and open to hear the voice of God and recognize what He would have us to do. And He'll work through that situation. He'll bring glory to His name and He'll supply for the good of many. We all know how this account ends. <clears throat> we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about it next week. But we know the good that can come when a single individual trusts God regardless of his circumstances. How much more of a benefit would it be if all of us in unity could trust the situation, trust the will of God in the situation and be a blessing one to another? The Bible tells us a three-strand cord is not easily broken. As someone did an ABM account on a bridge that had a, all, the, all the cables that held the bridge, the suspension bridge together, and how only, one of them could only hold so much, but together they were able to hold uh, an immense, immensely greater weight than the sum of the individual uh, strands. And so it is with us. Three-strand three cord is not easily broken. A 13-strand cord is far more strong than that. Who are we? And what would God have us to get out of this lesson? Any other comments? Before I close out. mentioned um, it wasn't necessarily Joseph that they were really angry with. Mm -hmm. You know, it was the treatment that Joseph received. The preferential treatment, yeah. Yeah. And um, so, you know, I mean, I think oftentimes, you know, offenses actually have little to do with full truth. <laughs> or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it might have just a seed of truth. Um, but it, it doesn't have to do with the actual full fact, just a little seed. But then see that seed then becomes a complete lie because, like I said, it, where it festers, you know, it may start um, with that truth, but then grows into it. Well, then they must have meant this, and then this, and you know, especially when talking about something someone says or did to you personally. Um, if we know the full truth of the situation, including someone's intent we will have a whole lot less actual offenses mm. um, that we have to deal with. Right. Because um, like you said, um, I don't believe anyone in this building and, and even further on in the church, uh, there's very few that would have actual intentions mm -hmm. in their heart to harm someone else. Right. Um, so if we remember that, you know, we don't know the full truth even though it's it's perceived this way, that's not always the truth, the full truth. Well, the devil likes to take what, what little we know yeah. and expand it in such a way that it makes it look bad. Yeah. And we need to understand, we need to understand the difference between the voice of God and the voice of the enemy. Right. Recognize when the enemy is trying to cause problems and rebuke him. And not allow ourselves to submit our submit to his lies. We'll go ahead and turn it over.